Entergy is proud to support programming on LPB and greener practices that preserve Louisiana. The goal of our environmental and sustainability initiatives really is to ensure that our kids and future generations can be left with a cleaner planet. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. It's really a new type of, uh, of medicine these days. Mayo Clinic searches for answers to COVID-19. I've always loved math and science. But this future engineer says she was initially headed down a different career path. What changed her mind? If this mutates in this or anywhere and it comes into an area uh, prone to hurricanes, it, it could be a disaster beyond comprehension. A doctor's warning, what if we get a second wave of the coronavirus and a hurricane all at once? You might say that I'm a dreamer. This type of viral is healing. Hi everyone, I'm Natasha Williams. And I'm Andre Morrow. Much more on those top stories in a moment on this week's edition of SWI. But first, a warning from Governor John Bell Edwards as Louisiana is seeing a surge in coronavirus cases. This comes ahead of a planned phase three decision. We're seeing an uptick in community spread and in patients hospitalized with COVID-19. Since June 10th, the state has identified 4,200 new cases of the virus. Health leaders say the numbers are alarming, especially in the Acadiana region, and that the increase is not related to an increase in testing. Based on these trends that we're seeing, every Louisiana needs to do a real gut check on whether he or she uh, has been slacking off when it comes to taking the proper precautions. Everyone needs to continue practicing the mitigation efforts that we know that work. Wear a mask or facial covering, social distancing, frequent hand washing, stay home when you're sick. And the most vulnerable members of our community should know they are always safer at home. And now let's check on other headlines making news across the state. 32 employees working on major renovations of the Superdome have been confirmed positive for the novel coronavirus. They're part of a team that averages 275 workers on any given day. The 32 have been isolated from the job site. The remaining workers are now under stricter rules to wear masks. Work on the dome has proceeded uninterrupted since the pandemic began. The stadium is undergoing $450 million in renovations. One casino chain says it'll lay off as many as 1,500 workers as a result of pandemic closings. Las Vegas-based Boyd Gaming Corporation operates casinos in Shreveport, Venton, Kenner, Opelousas, and Amelia. Revenue reports say the casinos have lost hundreds of millions of dollars. The emergency room at the Mid-City location of the Baton Rouge General Hospital is reopening after five years. It's part of the state's pandemic surge program. It's reopening under a contract with the Governor's Office of Homeland Security. The hospital is expected to be open for at least six months, with the possibility of an 18-month extension. The state is receiving $135 million in federal money to help elevate Highway 1 in Lower Lafourche Parish. It leads to Port Fouchon, which is a critical national oil and gas hub. U.S. Representative Steve Scalise calls the grant a major victory for our region's safety and America's energy security. The highway upgrade includes four phases. The 8.3-mile stretch will be elevated from Golden Meadow to Leeville. Work is set to begin on part of an $80 million project intended to help control backwater flooding in several southeastern parishes. St. Mary Parish signed off on the deal to begin building a permanent barge. The barge would be placed in Bayou Shen to block water that rises when the Atchafalaya River is high. A temporary barge has been used in the past. Governor John Bell Edwards is calling on all Louisianans to get serious about the 2020 census. At present, only 56% of people have responded to the census compared to 61% nationwide. 
So far, just 1.3 households in the state have answered census questions. That ranks 44th among all states. LSU's Board of Supervisors unanimously voted today to remove Troy Middleton's name from the library. It was expected, and school leaders say, the purpose is to remove racist symbols from campus. Middleton is a former LSU president and war hero. His troubled legacy surrounds a letter on desegregation he wrote to a former Texas chancellor back in 1961. He said LSU at the time made efforts to separate black students from white students. The Middleton family spoke at the meeting and denounced the decision by LSU. In news making legislative headlines, proposal pitched by Representative Ted James, who is black, to establish a police reform study in response to the killing of George Floyd by police in Minneapolis was debated this week after several white lawmakers called the initial language racist. The controversial language was removed and the measure passed unanimously. And now other headlines making news around the state capitol. House and Senate committees passed more legislation Wednesday aimed at lowering car insurance rates by limiting damage lawsuits. The governor vetoed the first version of this bill. The Republicans could still try to override the veto, but they're also trying to pass possible replacement bills before the special session ends July 1st. Governor Edwards did sign a bill backed by Republican leaders that gives $300 million of CARES Act money to help businesses. A House committee rejected a bill Wednesday that would have prohibited police officers from receiving immunity in civil cases involving abuse allegations. The bill by Representative Edmund Jordan pushed for police reform after the death of George Floyd while in police custody in Minneapolis. Members of the House Civil Law and Procedure Committee killed the bill 9-7, to seven, mostly along party lines. Louisiana municipalities will be barred from enacting most gun restrictions beyond those in state law under legislation signed by Governor John Bell Edwards. The measure by House Republican leader Blake Miguez won passage from lawmakers in the regular session that ended June 1st. Miguez's legislation, pushed by the National Rifle Association, will prohibit local governments from banning guns in businesses in most public buildings through ordinances that are tougher than statewide restrictions and nullify those already enacted. Edwards also signed a bill by Republican Representative Brian Fontenot to make it easier to carry a concealed handgun in church. The measure repeals a law allowing a concealed handgun permit holder to bring a gun in church only if church authorities inform their congregations. It also does away with provisions allowing church authorities to require anyone wishing to carry into their facilities to take an extra eight-hour class every year. But church authorities will still have to agree before allowing concealed handguns in places of worship. More Louisiana residents will have access to medical marijuana under a significant expansion of the state's therapeutic cannabis program that was signed into law by Governor John Bell Edwards. The changes in law will take effect in August, allowing doctors to recommend medical marijuana for any patient they believe it will help and remove restrictions on which doctors can recommend cannabis. Just before coronavirus began spreading and life changed, the Baton Rouge General and Baton Rouge Clinic became the newest members of Mayo Clinic Care Network, which allows affiliates to tap into a greater range of resources. I checked in this week with three Mayo doctors in Rochester, Minnesota, to hear about some of the vast COVID research at the hospital, which is ranked number one in the country by U.S. News and World Report. It's really a new type of uh of medicine these days, especially in the surgical atmosphere. Dr. Adair Robinson says the new type of medicine she is practicing, along with her husband William and their close friend Elvis Francois, is medicine in the era of COVID-19. All three are at Mayo Clinic. She's an anesthesiologist on staff, and William and Elvis will soon graduate from their orthopedic residency. They are on the front lines at a place where the clinic's COVID-19 research task force is going all out to better understand the virus and study potential therapies that might combat it. You know, speaking on behalf of everybody and, and, and really healthcare professionals everywhere is we really don't know the natural time course of this. We haven't known from the beginning. We've kind of been playing it on the fly, so to speak. The sense of urgency is unprecedented. There's currently more than 250 research projects at Mayo. 90% of Mayo COVID patients are enrolled in a study. Mayo Clinic has just recently announced that there are for, for employees and for people within Rochester and in the greater Rochester area, they've opened up um, uh, essentially free testing, um, screening testing for patients. So you can be tested for IgG, 
antibodies to see if you've at least gotten exposed to and or maybe recovered from the virus. And so I, that is a very, very, um, it's a great approach because that, that opens up the, the, um, the freedom that we'll have to other centers being able to test at large scale. One uh, part of our you know, day to day now is making sure that all of our patients are tested before they come for any sort of elective procedure. So they're not only tested for the actual virus and evidence of the virus in their body, but tested for IgG uh, antibodies to see if they are um, potentially a plasma donor, you know, if that's something they're interested in. So we are, uh, we're making sure that we are trying to limit uh, our exposure as healthcare workers, uh, especially for these elective surgeries, higher risk procedures where we are involving their airway and secretions and things that put us at risk. We are doing a really good job of testing across the board um, despite our large surgical volume. So that's been encouraging. The clinic is also leading a national trial into the use of convalescent plasma to treat patients hospitalized with COVID-19. All of the people who have gotten COVID-19 and overcome the infection, their body has been able to overcome it by producing antibodies against the virus. And so once they are no longer infectious and they have been quote unquote cured from the virus, those antibodies circulate through their blood. And those people are kind and selfless enough to come to an institution that is a part of this program and donate some of their plasma, which is then obviously for immunology purposes, sterilized and cleaned. And then those antibodies um, are then studied and given to other people to help them fight the virus that they are actively fighting. So far, more than 30,000 donors have come forward and enabled 22,000 patients to be treated. The initial data shows there is a safety profile behind it. There are uh, upcoming studies that have yet to be published that are larger, uh, showing similar results. But the efficacy is still, you know, anecdotal. There's no study on efficacy yet, but it's uh, from a safety standpoint, we are, um, I think, really pleased with those results. It's not yet known if this therapy will be an effective treatment for COVID-19, but it might improve a patient's recovery time. So how do you manage your patient's expectations when they come in with fear or perhaps another procedure, but all anyone's thinking about is coronavirus? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's, you know, and sadly, that's where we're at is, is someone comes in for a very big operation and they should be nervous about that, but they have this kind of distractor going on at the same time, so it just compounds the fear. I think you hit the nail on the head. We have very, very strict, regimented, well-researched, well-thought-out protocols that have been put in place to mitigate the risk to both the healthcare workers and the patients. Thank you so much for being on the front line, and um, thank you so much for all of this work that you do to help people through this. Thank Absolutely. You. Thank you. Yeah, thank thanks you. So much. And plasma donors are needed for research. You can check out this website, uscovidplasma.org, for more information. And in a moment, what we didn't hear yet from two of those three doctors. What happens if hospitals in the state are forced to battle the coronavirus and a powerful hurricane at the same time? It's a scenario area doctors and other health experts say is their greatest fear, but a very real possibility. Dr. Jim Aiken, professor and co-chair of the LSU Division of Disaster Medicine and EMS, has unfortunately had lots of experience in providing much-needed health care in the midst of a major storm. Hurricane George's and Katrina, a name that still strikes fear in many throughout the state, but now his concern is that we will have another serious outbreak of the coronavirus at the same time another powerful storm forms in the Gulf. With these uptick in the cases, you know, if something were to ha or start coming across the Atlantic, or to come out of nowhere like um, the last tropical storm did, what is the scenario going to be in a week? And, uh, you know, 25% of the people who do get infected need immediate hospitalization. And, you know, Louisiana does not have the best health care um, uh, statistics, so we got hit hard. Uh, our mortality rate was higher than national. And... First of all, obviously, it impairs our ability to take care of people, not just hospitals, but everywhere. But there's uh, having a pandemic uh, present in a community adds 
other challenges that we don't face in other circumstances. Evacuation is the mainstay of our response to a, a higher category type of, of, of hurricane. So if you're, you're planning on evacuating, first of all, um, are there going to be any issues with people allowing you to come into their area? How do you pick the places you go? If you're dependent on shelters, how COVID friendly, how, um, uh, you know, what sort of, of additional risks are you going to have? So the planning for responses to hurricanes in the, in the uh, presence of a pandemic, as you know, exists everywhere, become even more challenging. Dr. Aiken says with all this in mind and weather experts calling for a hurricane season with up to six major hurricanes, we must all take the what ifs very seriously. The most important thing for you to do is everything you can not to get infected. Um, in the past, our ability to take care of patients is usually impaired for several days. If you look at at, at, in the past at our incidents of people being infected, but most importantly, people who got so sick they had to come to the hospital. In that first and second week of March, it, it rose like a rocket. I mean, it was a 90 degree graph at that point. And that will happen very, very quickly. And so, you know, for us who have now been through this and for us who have been through hurricanes before, uh, the, the challenges are, are are very, very great. He says as we are navigating a phase two reopening and moving towards phase three, we cannot let down our guard. I've become disappointed at the lack of people wearing masks. And, and I went to my first restaurant since uh, all this started and we were seated very appropriately. And my wife and I had a mask on. Uh, and then I saw other people coming in without masks and one person self-selected a booth right behind us. And I was no more than a foot away from that person who was not wearing a mask. People have to understand it's what they do, not what I do, uh, but it's what they do that will determine just how serious a problem this will be this summer during the hurricane season. Dr. Aiken says hospitals and medical centers are gearing up, stockpiling PPE and other much needed resources, and we need to be prepared too. It is hurricane season. We say this every year. You have to have your own disaster plan and certainly an evacuation plan in the face of a pandemic means that you want it, you know, it's all on the website, CDC, Louisiana Department of Health and Hospitals to take a look at it. You want two masks per, per person, you want lots of hand sanitizer, and you want to have, I would say two, one, you know, place where you check it out, they will let you in, uh, and, but still have a have a backup evacuation place to go to. Dr. Aiken says don't wait until the last minute to pull out and leave early to avoid traffic and other issues like states that may not let you in. Kelly Brown graduated from Lee Magnet High School late last month with a special STEM diploma, and this fall she'll be attending Penn State University. She's one of a handful of girls that were a part of a special program that encourages students, especially girls, to pursue STEM careers. Brown is making all the right moves on her way to getting a high-paying job that she now loves. Kelly Brown knows all too well other girls will benefit from the trail she's blazing. When I first started the program in uh, 10th grade, I was the only girl in my principles of engineering class, but as um, the years continued, we started to see more girls, especially in the robotic and uh, engineering developmental design courses. So that was really nice to see going from one girl in a class of 30 other boys but girls, particularly African-American girls like Brown, are still disproportionately represented in science, technology, engineering, and math classes, and therefore don't go on to pursue the high-paying STEM careers. Brown says her experience has been a good one. Even though there aren't many girls there, it feels more like a community. And when there is another girl, it's like the tightest bond ever. Um, like on my robotics team, 5884A, there are only two girls out of the five of us, but me and her, we are best friends. So while there's underrepresentation, it's 
really more like an uplifting community, at least in high school. She says she wasn't always interested in becoming an engineer. I originally wanted to be a vet, and I had wanted to be a vet since I was about five years old because uh, I had always worked with horses and other types of animals, so I wanted to be an equine vet. And then I decided to take some of the engineering classes for fun because I had done robotics for a year in sixth grade and had done some maker spaces in seventh and eighth grade. I was like, oh, we'll give this a shot. That's my brother's major in college. It'll be fun. And it changed my entire outlook on what I wanted to do. She credits the STEM Pathways program at Lee Magnet High School for shining a spotlight on her path to a STEM career. It provides a lot of mentoring and it forces you to take what you've learned in other classes. So basic math principles, calculus, algebra, geometry, and then apply them to a real problem that you are trying to solve. So the gateway course at in all of the STEM pathways is the introduction to engineering course, where each project is from a different field of engineering and you're, the students are presented with a new problem each time. She says the real life problem solving made the experience all that more interesting, drawing her in even further. If you're in the civic um, engineering course, you're building bridges, you're building buildings. The next week, you're in more of an industrial engineering sense and you're making processes as efficient as possible. And then next, maybe you're doing electrical and you're building circuits and learning how direct and alternating currents work. So it's really nice to give you a taste of everything. She says, although it was challenging. There's always a group of people around you that are struggling as much as you are and your teachers will guide you in the right direction. They won't give you all the answers, but they'll steer you on the path you need to go or jog some spark that allows you to see a problem from a different perspective that you didn't uh, necessarily consider before. The 17-year-old is headed to Penn State this fall to major in industrial engineering after graduating with 23 others that were a part of the first class to successfully complete a rigorous curriculum that will prepare them to excel in STEM careers. Brown received a gold diploma endorsement in pre-engineering, something that gives her a leg up before she ever takes her first class in Happy Valley. The seals on our diplomas really show colleges that we're coming in with prior knowledge. I've taken these courses. I am endorsed by an accredited university as ready to start classes early. So like I've finished most of the prerequisites through um, AP and engineering courses and the STEM pathways gave me the opportunity to finish a junior level engineering course. Brown credits her STEM Pathways robotics teacher, Vanessa Bagan, for helping her get on this path and helping her succeed in high school. Governor Edwards this past week signed three pro-gun bills into law. Two of them allow bringing firearms into houses of worship and transporting them into areas where they are banned. Last July, Louisiana Public Square examined the challenges of keeping guns out of the hands of youth since many cities see upticks in violence during the summer. We're rebroadcasting this episode this month. Youth and Guns can be seen Wednesday, June 24th at 7 p.m. There'll be an encore presentation on Saturday at 11 o'clock on LPB. Visit lpb.org slash public square for more information. Earlier, we heard from three Mayo Clinic doctors. There's a good chance you recognize two of them because of what they do in their spare time. Elvis Francois sings. William Robinson plays the piano. About two years ago, a video that Elvis posted of them singing went viral, and the singing surgeons have been in demand ever since. Ellen DeGeneres was one of the first to take notice, and she brought them to Hollywood to perform on her show and talk about the healing power that music can deliver. Networks called. They're big. So big that last month they took their talents to the Indy Motor Speedway. Now the Indy 500 didn't happen. It's delayed until August. But they performed right there on the track, a tribute to frontline workers to raise COVID awareness. They tell us music moves people in a way medicine can't. So here they are, Elvis Francois 
and William Robinson. Thank you guys so much for having us on. It has been our honor. We hope that you guys stay safe, stay strong, and know that everything is going to be all right. When you're feeling low and there's no one around, when it looks like it's over and life's got you down, hold on to me, brother. I'll be here when you need, cause there's a brighter tomorrow, this I truly believe, that everything, yeah, everything is gonna be alright, everything, yeah, everything is gonna be alright, cause when you're feeling low, and you can't feel the light, everything, yeah, everything is gonna be alright. So wipe those eyes, it'll be alright. Yeah, don't you cry, it'll be alright. And I know, and I know, and I know, and I know, there'll be troubles outside. But everything, yeah. Everything is gonna be alright. In these difficult times, uh, we're wishing you love, peace, and health. Uh, thank you so much for having us on, and uh, uh, we hope to see you all soon. So fortunate to feature the singing surgeons. Beautiful music, just makes you feel better. In April, Elvis dropped a four song extended play record called Music is Medicine. He is donating proceeds to COVID-19 relief charities. I think I will definitely pick up a copy. I would love to get that too. And everyone, that's our show for this week. Remember, you can watch anything LPV anytime, wherever you are with our LPV Anywhere app. The download is free from your app store. You can catch LPB News, Public Affairs, as well as many of the Louisiana programs you've come to enjoy over the years. And please like us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For everyone here at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Morrow. And I'm Natasha Williams. Thanks for watching. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Entergy is proud to support programming on LPB and greener practices that preserve Louisiana. The goal of our environmental and sustainability initiatives really is to ensure that our kids and future generations can be left with a cleaner planet. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you.